Good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to have you all here and to welcome you, all of you who have chosen to come together today to discuss what a feminist foreign policy might look like for the Netherlands and for the countries and the communities that we work with. I would like to thank the people who came together in this beautiful room, but also the ones on the live stream that I think I'm looking at now. Many people from elsewhere in the Netherlands and from abroad are joining us today to discuss feminist foreign policy together. It's my great pleasure to welcome you, especially in this beautiful auditorium of the Peace Palace, which to us seemed only fitting that we have joined our efforts together in this particular room because of what it stands for, obviously, because it represents global cooperation, it represents solidarity, and it represents peace. And we thought that that was the right place to discuss the many opportunities that we think arise, arise from the opportunity to work together on a feminist foreign policy. Feminist foreign policy. Some of you may have thought hearing the term and it may have alluded to you because you feel it's about women's rights and that it is about time that women's rights are fully acknowledged and taken into account worldwide. Others may have thought this is great, we're going to talk about a policy that is about gender equality and that is inclusive not only of men and women but also of people from all types of gender identities. And maybe others of you will have thought and may have the hope and the aspiration that this is about being inclusive of all types of marginalized groups around the world and that it's going to be about contributing to resolving existing inequalities and unequal power relations. Whatever may have been the reason for you to be here today, we are very grateful for the opportunity to discuss feminist foreign policy with the guests that we have invited and we think that there is no single one definition of it, not a one size fits all approach. And that the different countries that have started developing a feminist foreign policy have all done so in different ways. It started with Sweden, obviously, in 2014. And Sweden and Laser was followed by Canada, by France, by Germany, by Spain, by Mexico, to mention a few. And they've all have different experiences and practices. And we are very happy to have representatives of Canada, mm -hmm. France and Germany in the room with us today to share what this has been like for their respective governments. My name is Reintje van Haring and I am the host today for all of you during this event. I am the CEO for CARE Nederland. CARE is an international NGO, it works on fighting poverty and defending dignity worldwide. And in our organization, we have gender equality and equitable partnerships at the heart of everything that we do. And to give you a bit of a sense of what that means for us as a kickoff of the event, we would like to show you a short video. Very deliberately watching. Thank you. When women rise, humankind flourishes because gender equality is about all of us would you play a game with half your team's best players sitting on the sidelines didn't think so when women lead we create diverse seats at the table triggering opportunities but globally only 21% of ministers are women. When we run businesses, we boost economies, but 70% of women are legally restricted from having equal work opportunities. Access to finance equals the power of choice, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, 73% of women are unbanked. Systems need changing globally on multiple layers involving different players, engaging allies, facilitating accountability and transparency, brokering with financial institutions for tailored solutions, backing social movements, 
amplifying voices of change, lobbying with decision makers. Women can change the world, but to do so, the world needs to change. Join us. And with that, I would like to invite our first guest to take her place on the podium. She will give us a perspective of what a feminist foreign policy might mean for the Netherlands and for the countries and the communities that we interact with. Please welcome. We'll steal some water. Is that you? <laughs> I present Pascal Grosenhuis to you. She's the, with the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She's the director of the Department of Social Development. And on top of that, and more importantly, she's the Ministry's <coughs> Ambassador for Women's Rights and Gender Equality. Pascal, please. Thank you, thank you. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's such a pleasure to be standing here today and to celebrate already tomorrow's day for International Men's Day and to speak with all of you about the feminist foreign policy and on how we engage boys and men. Just to summarize at the beginning, for the Netherlands strategies to engage men and boys, do not operate in a silo, but rather form part of a comprehensive strategic framework to achieve gender transformation and equality. But maybe let's start at the beginning. So when you bring up feminist foreign policy, you said it as well. Many ask, what are you talking about? Some are bothered by the term feminism. Some by the idea of anything at all being different. And others think at long last. And you can probably think where I am. But everybody you speak to wants to know what's behind it. And that's why, because I go any further, I would like to use three images to illustrate what feminist foreign policy means. Start with Lima, age 16. She's the same age as my daughter Sophie. In spring this year, she stood in front of the locked doors of the school in Afghanistan with tears in her eyes. Since the Taliban violently regained control of the country, we now have an entire generation of girls for whom going to school, the right to education, can no longer be taken for granted. The second image is the picture of a mother in Kenya, in the Maasai village I just visited last week. She's considering marrying her daughter off, 11 years old, because the drought is pushing her family in extreme poverty. And the third image is all the brave women in Ukraine, in Yemen, in Syria, and many parts of the world who are victims of sexual violence in conflict and war zones. And for me, those three images show why a feminist for foreign policy is just not only needed, but in fact overdue, why it's a no-brainer. After all, no country in the world, no economy, no society can afford half of the population not to be able to have their say as equals or play their part. As early as 2015, McKinsey calculated that the equal participation of women in the global labor market could increase global GDP by 26% within 10 years, enough to eradicate poverty in large parts of the world. It's therefore not only a key right of women and marginalized groups to participate as equals, but it's also economic lunacy not to pursue feminist foreign policy. We are talking about our whole society. We are not talking about doing less, but about doing more, about bringing everyone to the table. And it's needed. The crisis around the world, whether it was COVID, climate, poverty or war, pushed the rights of women backwards instead of forward. And that is why we are drawing up guidelines for a feminist foreign policy in the coming months. And thankfully, we are not starting from scratch. And thankfully, we're not alone. We can learn and we are learning from others who embarked on this path before us, like the colleagues who are sitting here in the front and also the colleagues in Sweden, Mexico, uh, uh, Chile, Colombia, and very recently Liberia has announced that they will have a feminist foreign policy. So also the concept that it's a Western idea is just not true. Uh, I was, had the pleasure to be in, uh, in Berlin in September at the first ministerial meeting uh, with all the countries who pursue feminist foreign policy. And the Honorable Minister Annelene Boerbach stated very clearly, it's, just not, it's not just feminist foreign policy. We always have to remember that it's not about swift success. Sometimes you have to persevere for years or even decades. 
And what is decisive about the feminist foreign policy is making a start and never give up. Ladies and gentlemen, last week, and I think I know some, some of you actually have read it and already commented on it, both Minister Hoekstra and Minister Schreinemacher sent their letter to Parliament, stating what we have done since we announced in May that we will pursue a feminist foreign policy. We will follow the 3R approach that Sweden uh, used before us. Mainstream is a cumbersome word, but its meaning is relatively straightforward. Namely, the feminist foreign policy is not only an afterthought, but it's an approach, it's a working method, which permits our entire foreign security development and trade policy. So before we do anything, we take a very conscious decision to look at a gender lens. What does our policy mean from a gender perspective? Let me start with the first R. A feminist foreign policy is all about rights. We are seeing in dramatic fashion currently in Ukraine and also in other parts of the world, that certain groups are affected particularly badly by violence, by Russia's horrific war. It is above all affecting women, the elderly and children. It's affecting those who cannot flee at the drop of a hat or who are attacked due to their gender on top of the sheer brutality and hardship of war. It's affecting women and girls, but also men and boys who are abused, who in the chaos of war cannot receive the treatment that they so urgently need. The other point is that when rights are denied, this injustice is at some stage brought to trial. And that too is part of the R. That we guarantee the right to protection and where we cannot guarantee protection, we need to call those who infringe upon and violate rights to account. As Minister Hoekstra demonstrated during the accountability conference in July, accountability is a huge priority for us. To achieve accountability, to bring charges with regard to sexual violence and crimes committed against women and men, we will work together with the International Criminal Court, with human rights organizations, with public prosecutors. And I know very well that we have people and organizations who are with us in this room. And what a fitting place actually to be speaking about this. Who did this before feminist foreign policy was a given? Who called these crimes by their name and then brought these crimes before the courts here in The Hague and in other countries? As you all know, human rights and the rights of women and girls are under pressure. We see this around the world and also in the EU. For instance, when countries withdraw from the Istanbul Convention, when countries don't want to align with EU standard language. And I think we need to keep reminding ourselves of the question of the so-called everyday violence against women, also in the Netherlands. I think in the Netherlands, every nine days, a woman is being murdered because she's a woman. And next week, with many of you, and government departments and companies and all our embassies abroad, and I know all embassies here as well, we will raise attention and awareness to combating violence against women at the 16th days campaign that we call Orange the World, resulting very fittingly in Human Rights Day on December 10. Because we all know women's rights are a yardstick for freedom and democracy in our societies. And for this very reason, women's rights is not a women's issue. It's a human rights issue, it's a democracy issue, and it's a rule of law issue. The second R is about resources. And when we start to, start to tackle a crisis, like the climate crisis we're now trying to work on in Shaman Shaikh, we thankfully stand together in making a lot of international climate funding available to combat the climate crisis, even though it's not nearly enough. And we need to be sure from the outset to anchor the gender aspect in our minds and most definitely also in agreements concluded. As we see at COP now, it's clear that a neutral or gender neutral budget is not a given. They're always interested play when we deal with money, with power and resources. And that is why when we are providing support, we always have to bear gender equality in mind. That's why we sent a negotiator specialized on gender language to Shaman Shaikh. She's sitting here somewhere in the room, doing a really good job. And that is why we are trying, and this is another sphere which requires considerable perseverance, to apply gender budgeting to the work we do as a foreign ministry to our projects. 
And the OECD estimates that we're already on the right track, whereby around 80% of our ODA is geared towards gender equality, either directly or indirectly, but we can and we should do more. And here too, thankfully, we can learn from others. The third R is, R is about representation. Because it's obvious that the question of where money should go is discussed and decided differently when only individual groups have a seat at the table rather than everyone. For all of us, it is clear that we don't see women and girls as victims, but as part of the solution, as decisive actors when it comes to negotiating peace agreements, or better, protecting their country from climate change. That is why it's so important that this angle is represented, not just in groups negotiating peace, but also when it comes to adaptation, loss and damage, and climate funding. Because the participation that implements solutions happens on the ground, in villages, in businesses, perhaps in the fields and in communities. Let me start to build a bridge to today's theme on how important it is to engage men and boys. Because gender equality is not a women's issue, nor can it be solved only looking at women. And that is why I'm very pleased with Minister Hoekstra, strong stance and leadership, and also Minister Dijkgraaf, who is on a national level. I think it was just today that the emancipation note was in uh, the Council of Ministers. So having a feminist foreign policy actually also caused uh, a discussion in the, to our national domain to see if we shouldn't be more ambitious on that. And I'm very happy with many men in the ministry and at our embassies who are working really hard to ensure women's rights and work towards gender equality. And I'm also very pleased that we have men sitting here today. Engaging men and boys is also needed in order to increase their understanding of the harmful effects of violence and to ensure that they take responsibility and are held accountable for their behavior. And this is being addressed in the resolution on violence against women which we worked on together with our French colleagues in a third committee last week. I think 166 countries voted in favor, which is uh, really good in this quite challenging multilateral uh, space. This resolution also addresses the need for monitoring the impact of national policies, of programs and strategies that address the roles and responsibilities of men and boys. It also addressed harmful stereotypes, and by that I mean harmful for women and for men. And more specifically, it called upon equitable sharing of responsibilities in respect to, to care and the household, something that in the Netherlands is also a topic of debate. In the further implementation of a feminist foreign policy, we need to be working together. All of us, men and women, governments, NGOs, private sector, academia, to fight the pushback from regressive powers, to fight inequality and injustice to join a progressive coalition and to fight for good. I, I just returned from Kenya uh, on Tuesday and there was a beautiful visit that we did in our SRHR program. There was a Maasai village uh, that I visited and it had a 98% of FGM two years ago only. And then the chief, an elder man, has three daughters and he said, I will not have my girls cut. And then the newly elected deputy governor, also men, with two daughters and a son, also said that they wouldn't do it. And then the majority leader also said, we're not going to do it. And it was the first county in uh, Kenya that actually uh, designed a law to prohibit FGM. And only two years later, the number went down from 98% to 50%. So that just shows how really important the role of men is especially in those communities, and also to stick together and to listen to each other and to challenge tradition and harmful norms. Through that joint leadership, being very outspoken on television in, in, in the communities about their opinion, and by challenging stereotypes and gender norms, they made a huge progress and an amazing impact in the lives of girls. And you probably all know, but if you, if you don't have the cut, you can go to school and you don't have to be married off. And they had plays and they had art on to show what it means for a girl on when she's 11 not to have the cut and how it will change her future. So it's only fitting that I conclude with an African verb that you all know. 
but it's I think it's it really goes for gender equality and um, yeah progress as well. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascala, for emphasizing that we are all invited to join the ministry in yeah. this effort. And I would say also for stressing that feminist foreign policy is not just the right thing to do, but also a smart thing to do. And I'd say also for emphasizing the importance of particularly engaging and not forgetting about the importance of engaging men and boys in the process. And I think what we will show you next uh, it's, it's another film that emphasizes how important that is. Maybe we can go to that. Construction social that vehicles the environment, the security of the world, the rich diversity of the people, and the considered as a menace pour sa masculinité et ses privilèges. Nous engageons les hommes et les garçons dans une approche synchronisée, focalisant sur la déconstruction de la masculinité hégémonique et la prise en compte des besoins spécifiques des hommes et des femmes de l'Église. Au lieu d'avoir les hommes comme alliés, on les avait comme adversaires. Tout simplement à partir un peu de notre façon de poser le problème. Parce que si tu dis que c'est les femmes que tu dois appuyer, ça veut dire que les hommes constituent le problème. Donc en les considérant comme le problème, on ne crée pas les conditions effectivement de leur coopération ou de leur euh, collaboration. Donc on crée une certaine adversité où les hommes nous voyaient comme des adversaires. Comme vous voulez travailler pour les femmes, Nous, on est à côté, vous nous avez marginalisé, vous nous avez discriminé, on vous attend. Alors, donc, on a compris qu'il fallait changer un peu la façon de poser le problème. Donc, au lieu de voir désormais les hommes comme le problème, on a changé un peu notre approche pour les voir comme une partie de la solution. وهذه توزع فيها الادوار والمساواه او التكامل هي ميزه للرجل والمراه بحيث انها تمشي عمليه دائره السلام وعجله التنميه في المجتمعات. Euh, la lutte contre les VSPG, 
on ne peut pas atteindre un développement durable. Continuing with contributions from abroad, we have a very special guest with us today, unfortunately online, but still we have her with us. Her name is Safa Rawia. She is the general manager of a Yemeni NGO that CARE works with, the Youth Leadership and Development Foundation. And Safa will now, and I see she is online. Hi, Safa. She will now give as her perspective on the importance of feminist foreign policy. Safa, go ahead. You may be on mute, Safa. I'm sorry, can you hear me no now? Worries. Yes, we can. So good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I would like to thank CARE for their keenness to amplify voice of Yemeni women from ground through this event. Yemen has been always identified at very low in terms of gender gap index. And since 2016, Yemen has ranked the last in the World Economic Forum gender gap. And unfortunately, the worst identified as the worst and the toughest place for female. Women face different obstacles mainly caused because of social constraints and political exclusion. These have influenced the daily lives of women, not only as Yemeni citizens, but also as human beings, as it deprived them from basic rights of which living with dignity comes at the top. Women have limited access to education, to livelihood opportunities, to health services. They have limited access to financial opportunities and to make decisions, not only, I mean, in general, uh, but even within the households, limited opportunities in participation in general. In fact, and unfortunately again, Yemeni women, they pay the heavy price of the war as violence against women has been increased. And this could be witnessed clearly from the child marriage cases, girls drop out from school, limitation of women mobility and exclusion of women from all peace uh, process and peace negotiation tables and around. The economic collapse caused by the war made obvious shifts in gender rules for many families, and women found themselves breadwinner and in charge, the first in charge of feeding their families. It's, however, very challenging because many of those women are not well prepared for this rule. They are either less educated, if educated, and not well equipped for this challenge, and more, they are tied up with the social norms, let alone the increase of domestic violence. Women are imposed to put in a situation that they are given accountability and responsibility with very limited authority and opportunities. The effect of the war is influencing everybody. I mean, all Yemenis are affected by the war, but as a Yemeni uh, activist, if you may allow me to say this, we, we blame the humanitarian assistance as it puts attention and priority for some fields. They're important, definitely, but it ignores other important fields like it gives priority for those services directly linked to the basic needs, including food security, health issues, but it ignored other social aspects that in the long term when, when hopefully uh, the war ends, Yemen will recover, but it will be very hard to recover with these impact, the social impact. And with also, I'll put special focus with uh, depriving women and youth from being hurt and from participating in drawing the new future of Yemen. The Youth Leadership Development Foundation, that's the foundation I work for, seniority and maturity as a national CSO established since 1998 with the main focus on youth and women made it clear 
for the organization and actually mandatory to engage men for women issues and not only to engage women for women issues. And we have very excellent examples Allow me just to mention some here, because we found them very impactful and with a strong results. We had a project called Women in Politics, where we tried to promote and enhance women political participation through engaging women and men from uh, political parties. They were trained on gender and other aspects, and then they together reviewed the institutions and bylaws of these parties, and they made lobby meetings to promote for women occupy more uh, or senior positions within the parties. Another interesting example is with a, a project called Tadafar. Tadafar is uh, an Arabic word. It means uh, collaborative or networking for safe age of marriage. Safe age of marriage is a very sensitive issue in Yemen. So we engaged uh, community leaders. They themselves, after getting, I mean, uh, trained and raised their awareness on child protection, they led community mobilization initiatives to sign MOUs at community level on safe age of marriage. A third example was on women leadership of, uh, for peace in Yemen, where we engaged men and women from government. They were trained on gender and uh, on different rights. And then they participated in development of policy papers and lobby meetings. They were trying to amplify voices of women from ground and also to, uh, to advocate for importance of women participation in peace process in general. Allow me to seize this opportunity and conclude with some recommendations through which we see um, it could enhance women's situation in countries uh, under conflict like Yemen. So first, support interventions that give priority for, for supporting and enhancing friendly and encouraging environment that enable women to participate efficiently in the different aspects, economically, politically, socially, taking into consideration an important fact that women are leading coping strategies during the war through creating economic opportunities and maintaining positive social cohesion, build up gender sensitive strategies that encourage both men and women to work together for men issues and women issues. This will help a little bit increase, uh, oh sorry, decrease the gap of the unintentional conflict that's created somehow, I would just speak for example from my, my experience in Yemen. It, it created, I mean the attention for women issues created some conflict between men and women. This might help bridge this gap. Gender conflict sensitiveness, uh, in some issues, addressing some issues like gender issues in Yemen, for example, gender is seen like Western um, uh, Western uh, uh, agenda, or uh, uh, and it's not very much accepted, but it's highly needed. So we just needed to be more sensitive in how to address it. Finally, women are part of the solution, but unfortunately, informally. And this is affecting the peace progress in general. So serious efforts to admit and recognize the role of women in playing, uh, I mean, major roles in peace building and how to channel their voices and their demands to the, uh, to, uh, to the decision maker tables is very important. Thank you very much and hope uh, I was informative. Thank you so much, Safa. I hope she can see me from here. And I hope you will stay with us because we will uh, ask you um, back for some comments after the panel. I'm always extremely impressed with, and it's Safa, and there's many more women in Yemen who fight for women's rights under very adverse and critical circumstances and continue to achieve results. I think it, it it's a big inspiration for the work that we do and to continue and with all the input that we've seen so far pascal is already up there i'm going to invite a few more guests up on the stage we have with us his, ex his excellency cyril jean nunn german ambassador to the netherlands if i can please ask you to go up then we are happy to have his excellency mr 
Monsieur François Alabrun, French Ambassador to the Netherlands. Thank you. We have Laila Albali. She's the Director of Women Equals Men, the Dutch Gender Platform. Please join us. Thank you for being here. And then we have Dr. Simon Wexler, and he is a political counselor to the Embassy of Canada in the Netherlands. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to join you over there. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you. And we are very happy that we get the chance to have a discussion with some people who actually have had the experience of implementing a feminist, developing and implementing a feminist foreign policy, and also to have Lila with us who can give a perspective from the Women Equals Men platform and their work for gender equality. I may just want to begin with the experts from experience and ask them what motivated your country in particular to develop a feminist foreign policy. Whoever feels ready, yes. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us. I think it was very good to have the voices from Africa and from uh, Safa. Uh, I myself spent the last 15 years in uh, Egypt, Iraq, Pakistan, Israel and Iran. So my perspective is very much naturally yeah. based on that. So it is indeed a feminist foreign policy. My experience is in these countries of the world. And I would like just to share what has been done also in the years before and where I think my government thinks and what my government will continue to think that it matters. The first one is that um, you indeed have to find something which is win-win. Let's take Egypt. You go to Egypt, um, there is a president in Egypt which struggles with the fact that his society is not where he wants his society to be, mm. because the president of Egypt would like more empowerment for the woman. Why is it so? Because in Egypt, you have also, for instance, the Al-Azhar University, which I frequented very, very much, which is an university which has a definition of where the woman has to stand, which is a different one of the president. So you have, you have strong forces of resistance in a country like Egypt. So what do we do, we as European, as Germans? First of all, we identify the, the, the elements which are beneficial for everybody. The first one is business. Uh, you identify business as a potentially, and it is, you have a company like Siemens, and they did that in Egypt, which in Ein Suchna, they invested um, in, a, in a university for 1,000 students for their worldwide Siemens market, 50% women, 50% men. The woman, excellent. And can you imagine from an Egyptian point of view how fantastic it is to have these Egyptian girls coming from wherever they come to, trained by a company and then sent to the world as the ambassador of Siemens and working for Siemens. So that's mm. one thing. The second thing is the German universities, there are two of them. The biggest one has 15,000 people, strictly 50-50 also women, uh, boys. Very, very important because you see after one generation now that these people are coming back into ministries, into that is what we, that we, what, what we can do. The president of Egypt, for instance, is a, is a big supporter of that, and uh, he would be also a big supporter of other countries engaging in that practical way. So that is one thing I wanted to say. The second one is about Pakistan, which is also a country where it is rather difficult. So what did we do in Pakistan? Also, that's the European Union launched a project of 100,000 qualifi qualified jobs 10 years ago. Uh, for young Pakistanis. And also there you had, you had a clear gender equality balance, which makes a difference. If you start to train 10,000 people in uh, the bus services or other services in Karachi and 5,000 mm -hmm. are women, it makes a difference. So my uh, uh, practical thing, I'm not very good at uh, the uh, high level of discussion because I don't know where that will lead us, but practically mm -hmm. there's a lot of things we can do. And I think uh, exchange of uh, good practices is probably the best we can do in our part of the world. Yeah. 
Yeah, very, I very much agree that we can talk about policies forever, but to come up with the practical examples and thank you for sharing them with us. I'm going to ask you for some highlights of the French feminist foreign policy. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting uh, me. It's a, a real honor and it's very important for me because, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, we, we are among the countries which uh, have uh, a diplomat uh, feminist diplomacy and uh, which won't really to, to affirm, affirm this as a priority. And as you may know, on the front of the Quai d'Orsay, which is the uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, this priority is really uh, um, affirmed very clearly and openly. Um, the question you asked is why? Why do we have such a, pol a policy? Um, I think, um, uh, I, I would say that first it reflects uh, the state of our own uh, public opinion. Mm. I think uh, uh, our diplomacy is also the, uh, inspired by the objectives, the priorities of our own society. and. Uh, and I think it's obvious that our own society, our own population, has really put this uh, uh, issue as a priority. And so it's obvious that our diplomacy is uh, inspired and influenced by that. It's also obvious that having affirmed for a long time human rights as uh, a priority for external uh, policy, uh, uh, the feminist uh, aspect of, uh, of human rights is uh, uh, logically uh, has become a very important aspect of our diplomacy because uh, women are uh, the largest group uh, in the uh, human population and the largest group of victims of discrimination and of violence. So it's obvious that our diplomacy has to take that into account. And I would be happy, of course, to come back to the different actions, fields, levels uh, that uh, um, are uh, now covered by this feminist diplomacy yep. now or later, as you want. That will be, I would like that. I, would, I saw Pascal nodding when we were talking about this. I would like to ask you what of this resonates with you and how how does it inspire you for the Dutch policy? Yeah, I think the practical always inspires me a lot. Um, and I think living in a, in a different country, I lived in Mozambique, I, you see what you need to do and how you can learn from that. But also what you said about it reflects our own uh, public opinion. And I think in, in times where gender equality and women's rights are really being pushed hard on, it's also hopeful eh, that you have leadership that actually pursues a feminist foreign policy amidst all the pressure from also parties within the Netherlands. And so I think for me, that resonated really well as well. It's a, it's a brave step. They, my leadership could have decided not to do it, but they did in spite of all the discussions on, on pushing to limit the space for women and women's rights. And so I think that that's why I was nodding. I was just like, yeah, it's mm. actually, uh, yeah represents the public opinion that thankfully is in the majority. Yeah. And what about Canada? Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there are about six things I'd like to point out in terms of what motivated us to pursue a feminist foreign policy. I mean, first and foremost, you know, our policy evolved in 2015, 2016, 2017 and onward. The international situation at that time, we were seeing a backlash. We continue to see a backlash mm -hmm. against women's rights, gender equality and LGBTI rights including with some of our closer friends and allies at the time. Um, and I think there was a sense that we needed to take the initiative, that we needed to push forward on this. Um, I'd be lying if, we, if I didn't say that we were also inspired by Sweden. Mm -hmm. um, I think Sweden helped in a number of ways. I mean, I think also breaking the taboo of mentioning the word feminist was mm -hmm. tremendously helpful to us. I think also, you know, as my French colleague said as well, it reflected our domestic policy. Um, what we were doing about a gender balance, balance cabinet, uh, you know, child care benefits, um, more flexible parental leave, for example, um, it reflected that. But I have to say that our feminist foreign policy is not just 
saying, okay, we're doing what we're already doing. It's actually challenging us to go further. Mm -hmm. And a really important thing to note is it's not by declaring you have a feminist foreign policy that advocates will say, okay, good, we're set. On the contrary, they'll say, okay, you said you had a feminist foreign policy. Yes. What about this, this, and this? And that's great. It propels us forward. And it brings me to another point, which is the role of civil society, which has always been critical in developing and perpetuating feminist foreign policy and refining it. So it's really important there. Um, I'd also say in terms of it evolved in some ways more gradually. So for example, we start with a feminist international assistance policy. Uh, and then we also had a women, peace and security national action plan. So we were expanding gradually. And so by the time we talk about a feminist foreign policy, we already had done in a number of domains. And then really the last thing to highlight it's obvious, but it's important to mention is to talk about the benefits, both both inherent and instrumental of a feminist foreign policy. Um, so this is not just charity, right? There are benefits for human rights, peace, and economic development. Thank you. I'm now curious, Laila, you hmm? sit here representing civil society organizations. <laughs> yeah. What do you make of this? And yeah. what do you think we should take into account? Uh, when it comes to feminist foreign policy, um, two things on a content level, and I was struck by uh, what Pascala already mentioned in her uh, speech, the three R's, yeah, the rights, representation and enough resources. Um, I would like to add one important one, and that's the reality check, yeah. and which means policy coherence. And it also resonates with uh, Safa's uh, story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yemen is one is a is torn by 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 the war, um, and yes, the Netherlands um, invests when it comes to SRHR programs in Yemen, and at the same time we sell weapons to repressive regime, Saudi Arabia that uses the the, the, the same weapons to to uh, fuel uh, the war in, in in Yemen. So the the reality check is actually crucial to make a feminist foreign policy uh, coherent, consistent, and meaningful. And that brings me to another aspect of the feminist foreign policy uh, on a level of process. Um, uh, it really needs to be a co-creation with civil society. So the process developing a feminist foreign policy is as important as the policy itself. Mm. Um, yeah. And how do you see the role of civil society also in that reality check? What would that look like? Being the watchdog yeah. and make sure that, um, and perhaps we can add another one, another R is reporting, yeah. being accountable. Hold your own uh, government accountable for what it claims to be and what it claims to uh, improve because feminism, uh, feminist foreign policy is not business as usual. It's really disrupting the, the, the power structures that are there, uh, the patriarchy uh, that has a devastating effect on women and girls, but also on women, uh, men and boys. Um, so uh, civil society is crucial, um, but it also needs to be uh, self-reflective of its own internal organization. Mm -hmm. So how are they themselves organized? Are there enough women on leadership positions within or, uh, the, the, the civil society organizations? Is it intersectional uh, or is it only the white male dominated um, um, organization? Yeah. yeah. And I'm again going back for a moment to the experienced parties in the room. How did you manage to do that, to integrate, for example, perspectives of men and boys and perspectives of different groups of society in your policy? What did that look like? Well, I think some points have been said already, which are, uh, I think, uh, Swedish born, but which are uh, uh, making now traction also in our system. It's, uh, first of all, that the resources indeed have to be allocated. Was well, not always like that, but have mm. to be allocated in a way which is specifically defined by the aims of, uh, of uh, feminist foreign policy. Yeah. That is changing, and I would say if something changes in Germany, it is this one, for instance. It's very important. And the second is also the participation, uh, which um, not only in the many countries I served is, is unbalanced, but also in us. So that is something you can change in your own system. But I, I, would, I would also like Natu to say for me, what is very interesting and striking, and uh, perhaps um, you have some answers to that, is that uh, I always uh, saw the discussion in Europe or in Germany 
as being relatively far away from what I experienced on the spot, relatively mm. far away. So it is perfectly okay to be engaged, etc. here, and, and we have to start with ourselves. I completely agree with that. It's not my point. But you have to translate that. You have to translate that into a language and a policy, which is uh, also the policy of your partners, which are really completely different, but which are open to suggestions, which don't say no categorically, mm -hmm. and which you can reach with, uh, how do you say, with offers, with offers. Mm -hmm. And in these offers, our old offers were, well, let's build a bridge, let's be in our offers, in our new offers, well, we have to factor that also. And if we do that better, these offers will be accepted. Mm -hmm. And you gave a few examples of that, talking about the university. How do you then manage as a government that the people that work in your ministry and in your embassies actually do the things and implement the examples you just mentioned? Because it's also, it's a mentality shift, right? Well, we are, we are all of a certain age, but uh, we are all naturally also have lived on this planet in the last 30 years. <laughs> and in the last 30 years, all of us, we certainly have, well, uh, things have changed a lot, yeah. uh, also in my government, in my country. So I think this is not the real question. I think that okay. that will, that will, that will come, that comes, etc. Uh, um, the, the, the person are there, there is no mental blockade on that and, and the, the, the so-called uh, old white man is disappearing anyway, also in our system. So that is not the thing. The thing is, if you have an offer, if you, if you define something, and I think that we are able to, to, to make an offer, which is good also uh, looking at the ladies from Africa and mm -hmm. the gentlemen of Africa, translate that to, Bur to, to Burundi, translate that to Congo, mm -hmm. translate that to the countries yeah. where I was. And this is a real big effort. And by the way, now breaking a little lance here for the diplomacy, all of you who wants to become diplomats one day, that's a nice part of our job because that is exactly what you do on the spot. You, yeah. get, you, get, you get offers and then, okay, ambassador, put that on the market, put that on the road and it's nice. It's a yeah. good job. <laughs> <laughs> it's very interesting to hear that indeed it is about doing the same job, but having this extra perspective and always have it present always be aware of where the opportunities are. And I do think not only for white men, I think for many people that is a shift mm -hmm. in mindset. You want to comment on that? No, certainly. In, I mean, in terms of the process of developing our policy, which is still a work in progress, we have a public uh, feminist international assistance policy, a feminist foreign policy is still being developed. Um, but not to make an excuse for this, but the consultation process is really important for us um, and has been extremely extensive. You know, we've had roundtables and seminars with over 200 participants from over 15 countries. We've solicited written input from 400 partners. We've had our Canadian missions abroad engage with civil society and other partners around the world. We've also consulted with other government departments because, you know, our, our foreign policy is not just a foreign ministry many other ministries and they need to be brought on board mm. um in canada specifically you know we're very aware of intersectional aspects so looking at um you know race uh gender identity um disability for example and we want to make sure that we are taking those into consideration and in particular an indigenous perspective because as you may be aware uh the rights of indigenous people in canada is, is really a work in progress and it's something that we need to be addressing more urgently. Um, so we had a component looking at that. And I think the key thing for us is having a diversity of stakeholders. Um, it's time consuming. There's no question about it. Um, and you'll get divergent answers on certain things. You won't always get convergence, which sometimes is frustrating if you're trying to develop a coherent policy, but no. that's the nature that's the nature of the process, and I think we have to accept that. Yeah. And then just to speak very quickly about the point about how to integrate this and how we are working methods, this is something that I think really as a next step is tremendously important. Um, so one thing that we've done when I was at the UN in New York is we developed a, a gender pledge, which is just a document that everyone can, you know, it's fairly simple, but it talks about not just the policy, but the actual, your working methods. How do you recruit people? How do you manage them? How do you make their priorities in terms of their jobs? What kind of lens do you take on all policy issues? How do you address communications, staffing? How do you address, um, you know, allegations of harassment in the organization? All those things are really critical and they're built into the accountability framework for performance management of all our diplomats. Yeah. So that's a concrete example. So again, it's about making it practical and making it concrete. And maybe to tap on that, because yeah. I think our permanent mission in New York copied from your permanent mission yes. and how our embassy in China and other embassies are copying it too, because it's, it's so pragmatic. 
Hmm. Uh, and I didn't know that it was a booklet. I only saw the digital one. But that's how you can also learn from each other and, mm -hmm. and copy some really good ideas. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Any insights from France? Um, I, I would like to underline that uh, uh, this uh, diplomacy uh, has a, a global ambition, which is really to, to transform the, uh, in a way, to transform our, our, really, uh, our world mm -hmm. and the way genders interact and the way women are perceived. And uh, so it, it needs really to mobilize uh, a, a diversity of uh, levels and tools and uh, yeah. and actions and so um, for us this this uh, this priority is present now really in almost all uh, fields it's present in our bilateral relationships uh, in particular regarding uh, uh, development uh, strategies and it has been really a priority of our uh, development strategies since 2007. And uh, we have adopted uh, different strategies uh, since then. And now this uh, priority covers almost all actions uh, in the field of uh, development. Uh, it, co it is present in our European policy. And uh, we have uh, supported the, diff the successive uh, gender action plans within the EU mm. and uh, we made this priority uh, this uh, issue as a priority of for instance the presidency of the EU that France had uh, for the first part of this year right. and we were able to get some concrete results for instance regarding initiative related to the participation of women in uh, boards of uh, companies with now uh, requirements which would which will apply to all EU uh, members and uh, uh, of course it's uh, and it has been already mentioned a very important aspect of our multilateral uh, uh, diplomacy mm. we have of course supported and ratified uh, instruments legal instruments in this regard since the uh, Convention against uh, all forms of uh, discriminations and other uh, commitments. We have been uh, really happy to work closely with the Netherlands, and you mentioned mm -hmm. it uh, yeah. very recently uh, for the adoption of uh, uh, resolution against uh, violence mm -hmm. uh, against uh, women. We co-chaired uh, last year with uh, Mexico the uh, uh, Generation Equality mm -hmm. Forum. Uh, which was the most important uh, uh, feminist uh, diplomatic event since uh, uh, 1995, since the uh, Beijing uh, mm -hmm. uh, conference. And we are covering through that different levels, different fields, uh, uh, health, and in particular issues related to uh, reproductive uh, rights. Uh, and we uh, invest uh, a lot in this uh, in this field education uh, security and in particular protection of uh, uh, women against uh, sexual violence in conflicts mm -hmm. and for instance we will uh, uh, contribute uh, important amounts uh, regarding protection of uh, women in, in ukraine right, right now so these are uh, different fields that we that we cover. and of course we have our own uh, organization uh, and methods of work in the in the ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, we have requirements. We have had uh, for many years now uh, requirements regarding uh, nomination of women in uh, a high level uh, post in our in our system. Mm -hmm. We have uh, active uh, um, uh, uh, strategies regarding uh, fight against uh, prejudices and uh, and so. Uh, it shows the, the way we try through different actions yeah. and levels to, to cover the, this global question. Yeah, it's indeed about different levels yeah. and different sectors and aspects yeah. of yeah. the work of your government. I'm going to turn to Laila, listening to all the experiences and uh, outcomes of in other countries. What would you suggest and where would you, where do you see a role also as a gender platform? in working with the Dutch Ministry on developing this policy? 
um, developing a feminist foreign policy for the Netherlands. Well, I already <coughs> mentioned the, the two R's that I think are crucial mm -hmm. for uh, our own feminist foreign policy. Um, and not to see it as a one-time event. Yeah. You know, even if there is a policy in, in next year or in, in, in um, it should be like um, a continuous process in talking about what are what kind of choices has the government made? Um, uh, what is the underlying uh, idea? And um, um, and keep engaging civil society in in that process. Yeah, and make it more pro more inclusive over time. I agree that many of the examples speak to creating good examples in practice. Monitor what happens. Yeah, and that is, I think, also where your role comes in. I'm just wondering you mentioned the fact that as a you can have your foreign policy your feminist foreign policy but you deal with other ministries and other stakeholders who may or may not agree with you on the priorities in a feminist foreign policy how do you deal with if if you come you deal with a ministry um, of trade and they have a specific interest and it doesn't really take into account all the principles that you abide by. How do you have examples of that? And what would that look like? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have, I don't know if examples, but I mean, you know, from a German point of view, um, um, I would say also in the last years, the many embassies I had there, um, things were rather pragmatically organized not saying that we are not fighting for 1325 in New York and so we were doing that naturally, but now back to where we work. Um, and you know, you have to join the interests also of your own stakeholders. So I will give you an example. Mm. Um, in uh, Cairo and also in Baghdad, we have a center uh, uh, funded by the federal government of Germany where people who come back from Germany can knock at the door and get support. And some Iraqis do that. And people who want to go to Germany for reasons which are mostly non-political non but work can knock at the door and can be kind of indicated. Mm -hmm. And I will give you some numbers because the numbers are quite impressive. We have 80,000 Egyptians working in Germany now, 80,000, it's a big number. Now, also there the gender balance counts Meeting, meaning that there is a look, okay, it shouldn't be too much men, it should be also a, a lot of women, naturally according to the qualification. Back to my universities and the 27 German schools we have in the country, you have naturally done a system. So not everybody can do that, but I just say the system is naturally co-opted by all the ministries. The ministry's economy is happy to have people, the Minister of Migration is happy to have people who speak German who are qualified. The Minister of, 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 of Foreign Affairs, who is the boss of all that, is happy because it works more or less. Uh, the Ministry of, uh, of uh, how do you say that, um, um, economical development is, is happy because it funds that and he sees there is result. Um, and, and these are systems which grow, which mm -hmm. develop themselves. And, and that's very much what I did in all the embassies where I was. And, yeah. and not in countries where nothing works. Iran, nobody from Iran here, nothing works there, you can cannot do, but in other countries where things can work, well, you, you had to do that. So my 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 saying was all, always, let's do that at a European level, because um, it's obvious that it's a little bit difficult for some countries, but let's do that together, yeah. which is difficult, which is, but which is feasible, and till now we are not yet on that road. So that would be my answer to how you pack the interest uh, of yeah. different stakeholders together. Yeah. Yeah, just to the question about some of the difficulties in implementing a feminist yeah. foreign policy. I, I think one thing that um, I try to keep in mind is that there isn't a, I mean, you mentioned this at the beginning, there isn't a unitary feminist foreign policy directive. It's not that every question there is an answer to it and that there are often diverging views and competing views that we have to, uh, that we have to try to accommodate, um, which makes it a challenge because there isn't always a clear answer on that. Um, I think the second challenge we have is that there's some instances where we're 
being accused of hypocrisy when we're trying to carry out a feminist foreign policy on a range of domains, including in our domestic policy. So for example, in Canada, a national tragedy has been uh, missing and murdered indigenous women mm -hmm. and uh, something that we're still trying to address, but that has uh, been a major issue for us. And is it attractive criticism from governments, many of them authoritarian, who say you have no right to speak to us on any of these issues because yeah. you haven't addressed those issues at home. And I think it's really important for everyone that's pursuing a feminist foreign policy to be able to admit fault, <laughs> that, that we don't shy away from that. Um, but the key is that we're working in the right direction and we try to address that. Um, with regards to the other, uh, perhaps government uh, ministries, organizations, it is true that sometimes we have cultural resistance. Um, uh, that, that is something that needs to be overcome. It does take you know, leadership, communication, uh, sustained effort, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've noticed, for example, working in peacekeeping and military affairs is that uh, sometimes you have to identify where the cultural problem is. So for example, we had senior military people who were very close to their political leaders who understood why they were doing this. They had more junior officers who were from a different generation, a younger generation who understood, but it was the middle that saw this as a threat to their professional advancement mm. and didn't understand. And that's where we really had to focus our efforts. And I think right. that's an important part of uh, what we do there. Yeah. Um, the last point I'll just say about the trade-offs, Listen, trade-offs in foreign policy are not restricted to feminist foreign policy. We have these all the time. Economics versus security, human rights versus True. economics. I mean, this is, this is not new. This is something the foreign ministries have to negotiate all the time. And uh, that's, that's part of our job. What can I say? True. Thank you. Yeah, I think it becomes very clear that this is all about systemic change at different levels of society, within your ministries, across your ministries. But I find it very encouraging that there are so many concrete examples where this is actually beginning to work. I'm gonna ask Pascala what, how, what, this is not all new for you, I imagine, because I know that you have been in contact with each other, but what do examples from countries that have gone before us, how, has, how is that going to inspire you? I think it shows that it's a process that takes time. And I had to giggle a little bit about your cultural, because we're in the middle of that. Um, I think first, when it was announced, or when we were thinking about it, people mm -hmm. laughed at us, thinking, oh, that's a really silly idea. Then it was announced, and people just like, oh, shoot, what does it mean? And especially what you said, that people close to leadership understand. Mm -hmm. And the young people actually think, oh, why now? I, I mean, it's, 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 it's long overdue. And there's the middle one who thinks, oh, will I then become still mm -hmm. that in that position? So it's, it's, we're really in the middle of that. I think the consultation process is really important for us as well, but um, to be really honest, we also have ministers who are hugely ambitious, ambitious and who want to report on what we're doing and mm -hmm. how it has changed. And when we announced uh, the feminist foreign policy, the, the mantra was show, don't tell. So you could see in the, in the events that the ministers did, in the, in the communication, in uh, speeches that they made, uh, visits that they made, it, it was really, you could, you could tell um but, and then there's the, there's the uh, the pressure also from from politics to do it quickly from uh civil society uh, to do it as as ambitious and as inclusive as we can and as civil servants we're a little bit in between to be really honest mm. um and i think what it shows what we said in the beginning it's it's an ambition uh, a feminist foreign policy and it's a it's a working method and it's a goal that we work to because I think it would be really naive to say that now we announced it in May, we have a feminist foreign policy. No, 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 not at all. We've been in the process for five months. I think we took some major steps. There's really political commitment. But to be really honest, I think in 10 years, we can say what we have achieved. Yeah. And we will do that in consultation with you. And I think your point on coherence is really, really important. And that takes time because that's the that's the the way you do, and that's the interest that they are, and that's the work of the, of the diplomats and the foreign ministries. But I think the balance and the skill will change. But will it happen overnight? No. And, and uh, I'm, I'm super thankful for you and, and the partners of Women Equals Men, because you keep us on our toes, and that's exactly what's needed. So keep us accountable, also on the two R's, um, because I, I, I can see your point. I cannot promise that we will be there in six months. Um, but we have, uh, there's a great team in the, in the room as well, and I have the pleasure to work with them. We're really, really uh, working our ass off on this one. And mm. we think it's really important and the political leadership as well. And what is really interesting, 
we were working on the National Action Plan 1325 as well, together with civil society, together with many of the ministries. And also the feminist foreign policy was um, um, approved by our Council of Ministers, giving us buy-in with the other ministries. So I think there's, there's things that we definitely le learned from uh, the partners uh, sitting here. And, and also you mentioned Sweden very rightfully, because without Sweden, we wouldn't be here. Um, so I think, yeah, we can learn a lot and we're really actively learning. We also sometimes make mistakes, um, but I think it's, it's really feminist to own up to those and to do it better next time. So yeah. um, definitely keep us on our toes. Yeah, I was going to ask Laila for some final comments on exactly oh. that, that role that women equals men and all of us who are member of the platform that we should be able to play. How yeah. do you look at that in the months and years ahead? Well, I also have an amazing team who yes. uh, <laughs> who actually um, has also a social life, but has a lot of uh, a lot of work when it comes to uh, following the process of the yeah. ministry and uh, when it comes to feminist foreign policy. Um, but I also want to um, make sure that what it can unleash when you focus on feminist foreign policy and you do it in a way that it's supposed to do, uh, changing the status quo changing the power dynamics, changing the, uh, and, and also challenging the, the patriarchy, you will receive backlash. Yeah. And specifically the women's rights and gender equality activists, also in Cairo, also in Egypt, there's a very strong feminist uh, organization fighting for their political rights. But once you support them and you make them in the front line, they will receive backlash. And what are you going to do as one of the donors, as one of the, 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 the countries and also organizations that wants them to improve their, their, their rights, how you can create also a safe space yeah. when they yeah. receive backlash. Thank you. I think with this, I'm going to for now conclude the discussion among us, but we will have some questions from the audience. We had expected to have some um, reactions from Safa, who was just with us, but she had to go offline, so she will not uh, give her perspective on this. But we do have, we had a mechanism for all of you to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I also have a team in the room and they have been <laughs> looking at the, the questions that popped up mostly and have made a selection for us. So I'm going to ask Petra Stienen, who has a question. And you tell me for whom that question is. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm very happy that ha to have um, yeah, all these uh, wonderful male speakers on the day before the International Men's Day. It's tomorrow. Uh, congratulations, they always say, on the 8th of March. So now I'm congratulating you. <laughs> but going uh, to the... Uh, I'm actually a senator for D66, and I uh, think I've been able to plant some seeds when it comes to feminist foreign policy in my work for the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, mm -hmm. where we also were inspired by the work of Canada and other countries in Europe. Now, my question is, how can we make this about money? And I need the wisdom of the crowd. Um, we have our financial hearings with Minister Kaag on Tuesday. I'm going to play this very open. How can we ask a question to her that she will speak mm. up about finances, about gender budgeting? Mm. I'm here with my great team. <laughs> <laughs> is that a feminine thing to do, to say we are a wonderful team? <laughs> Anna Iradia, who is the secretary of our group in the, in the Senate. And we're grappling with this issue of gender budgeting. So actually, I need your help. Thank you. I'm going to start with uh, anybody a suggestion and feel free if anybody in the audience wants to respond. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Well, you will not be surprised when I, when I tell you, um, don't forget the companies, don't forget Campina, don't forget, <laughs> don't forget them. These are your money givers because they have interests. Uh, my experience mm -hmm. is German companies are very, very well susceptible to embark because it is in their own interest, not, not because they, they believe in changing things, because it is in their own interest. I give you the, inter the, the example of Siemens, which is really quite a striking uh, example, and they don't invest there to be shiny, etc. They invest because they produce personnel, which women who from today they are Finish go to Tampa, Florida, where there is Siemens USA. That is how it goes. And then later they go to back to, 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 to Egypt. And the Egyptian government is very happy about that because then you have women who are different than the average and, and who change the society from within. 
So my answer would be among other things, public money, etc. we have, but, but uh, this is a country of huge companies and I could name you 10 who have interest uh, in, the, in, the, in the canal zone in, 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 in Egypt and others. And well, these are your partners because mm -hmm. it is their interest. I don't think it's very difficult to convince them that it's good for their, for also for their chiffre d'affaires. <laughs> Thank you. Any other? Yeah, I think also with the finance ministry, you can talk about the World Bank and the IMF, uh, because that's, uh, I think those institutions is, is an easy bit. We have discussions with our uh, financial people and they said, well, it's not possible to gender budget. It's really complicated. But I know that Finland has been doing it for quite a long time. So I think if you find two maybe um, buttons to push on to keep it simple and to learn from the Finns, and to use their own uh, or, or, or our own foreign international uh, institutions in uh, in Washington, and also with the nominations of the of the the governors of the banks, because it's also about representation. And I think mm. we only have. <laughs> but actually, there's also the integral afwegingskade. Yeah, you know, totally. we already have the mechanisms in place. We yeah. only have to implement them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we all yeah. had so make sure that we implement the, the mechanisms that we already have. Yeah. The only thing I would add to is whenever there's a new policy or commitment, the first question always has to be where the money is coming from. If mm -hmm. there's new commitments, if there's not money coming with it, then where is it going to come from? And that question has to be asked every time. I think in a lot of international development work, it's a bit easier for you know we for the to tag the projects that have a main or component that's um, related to gender equality. But I think for everything else, and even doesn't matter what ministry it is, if they don't put money with it, then it means they're not, it's not serious in our view. And it's, that's usually what mm. we push back. Yeah. Thanks, Peter, for the question. I really like the way you're using this event as an input for the next. <laughs> okay, continue providing input to Peter. I'm going to give the floor to the next, and I only have names. I don't know what they're going to ask. This is, these are nice surprises. We have Anna Heredia. <laughs> yeah, that is so unfair. No, go How ahead. can I make it about money? <laughs> Some people did not Let's put see. their uh, organizations with the questions. So. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anna Heredia. I am, as Petra already said, uh, part of the team or the team of uh, the <laughs> success in the Senate. But I'm also a student of um, the Research Master International Development Studies and writing my master's thesis on feminist foreign policy. Uh -huh. So here on two occasions. Um, <laughs> might be inspired by the work I'm doing. And my question was, and, and maybe I'm directing it to you in the beginning, you said we find it really important to have an intersectional uh, feminist foreign policy. I think that is something that is actually agreed on by civil society and policymakers. But I still have a really hard time re thinking what does an intersectional feminist form policy mean also in practice, as you said, um, the, the practical examples are important, but how does, what does that look like? And connected to that, um, we just saw a wonderful video that really talks in still men, women binaries. Um, how can yeah. we move beyond that language as well? Yep. You see why she's on that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sure, I'll try to answer part of that. Um, um, about the question about intersectionality, it's interesting because we've had, um, I guess, several waves of policy initiatives that have come through so in the last, let's say, 10 years. So we had the first about international assistance policy, then a feminist foreign policy, but then we also had an anti-racism uh, policy that came into place, um, as I think everyone knows, uh, in the wake of, you know, a number of protest movements in the last couple of years in the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And I think it's forced us to be even more critical about our own policies about this, you know. So you're speaking to women, but you know, where are they coming from? Are they all white women? Or are they all from a certain group or a certain religious group, for example? And I know in the Middle East, you know, when we talk to some, some societies that are very split along religious lines, the answers about the needs of people are gonna depend on, on those other factors, not just whether they're, you know, uh, male, female, or other. So I think that for us is in terms of representation, who we speak to, tracking the data about who benefits for certain things. Now, I know in some societies and countries, it's a bit difficult. I'm thinking maybe of France where, you know, certain data, uh, it's frowned upon to collect certain data about race and ethnicity. 
which makes it hard. We don't have as much of a challenge on that. We think it's important to see where the money goes or who we speak to or how the policies affect others. But I think that's that's a, a key aspect of it. And of course, it goes beyond that. It's not just race. It can also be about disability. And not just that these, um, not just that disability and gender will affect things, but the interaction together actually makes things worse in some instances. It goes beyond just the addition of the two uh, factors there. So, um, and then that kind of segues a bit to your, your point about uh, gender identities. I'll be very honest, actually, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge in the development of our feminist foreign policy. We had a first draft that we developed, and then we spoke to a number of groups that work on LGBT rights. Um, and even the fact that I use the word LGBT, you could say LGBTI, LGBTQ2S, there's two spirit in Canada, incredibly complex. We actually had to go back to the drawing board and make sure that we were taking into consideration those factors as well. Um, but it is, when I was speaking earlier to the fact that there isn't one answer, and some of these are very contested, this is an example of that, where sometimes it's hard for us to come to a policy document because this is still being contested within the feminist movement itself, right? And um, I think in some instances, we, we can't come to a, an answer on this, but we have to take it into consideration. Mm -hmm. It's not a full answer there, but... Uh, <laughs> and we also have an LGBTQ foreign policy as well that we're developing. So we hope to take that into consideration in addition to everything else. Is that a good answer to your question? Thank you. Thank you. Then I have, and I don't have a last name, but Faraz from Warchild. Uh, actually, this is a nice segue because my the previous question kind of was on the same line. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, yeah. Uh, actually, this is something that touches upon on what respected representative of German ministry and Canadian ministry talked about, but it's uh, targeted towards the Dutch foreign feminist policy. Um, so the conversation is around non-binary identities, homosexualities, LGBTQI conversations, where we, uh, even in our uh, development work, humanitarian work, when we are working in countries that do not necessarily uh, accept homosexuality mm -hmm. by law, uh, we very quickly take a step back and we're like, oh no, we're not going to talk about it. And that's the biggest backlash that we face in our work. Mm -hmm. So I wonder in this, uh, in our feminist foreign policy of Netherlands, is there provision where we will make sure that we are advocating for those conversations with the power positions in the countries that we are engaging with and not you know taking a step back every oh, time yeah. just because culturally it's not accepted even though that doesn't mean those identities and those epistemologies are not existing locally thank yeah. you yeah i think um that discussion was part of our human rights policy since a long long time ago um I think it matters on how you do the discussion. So sometimes it's more effective to do it behind closed doors. Sometimes it's more effective to organize an event at the embassy. In certain countries, it's more effective to raise the flag, but it's definitely part and parcel of our foreign policy. And it was way before we had uh, a feminist foreign policy. Thank you for raising it. Yeah, thank you. We have Nadine Stamm. No, you'll need a microphone also for the live stream, <laughs> so the people online can hear you. Yes, thank you. My name is Nadine Stam. I work for Tierfund Netherlands. Um, something I've been missing in the discussion so far is how are we addressing the underlying norms and values which are often shaped by religious beliefs? Because in the countries we work with, about 18% of the people, 80% of the people, uh, adhere to one of the major beliefs in the world. And often the, the gender perspectives and the roles and also the harmful roles are shaped by those re religious beliefs. So how can we address them and which role do you see for faith leaders? <laughs> Who's ready to give an answer to that? I can uh, Laila, give please. a start. Um, um, you know, um, often you have the discussion between there is a um, a division between women's rights and being religious, right? That shouldn't be the case. Women's rights is a universal concept. It's a basic human right. Um, and it's also misused by the same men that want to stay in power because it fits their own agenda. 
uh, to have a certain interpretation of a religious text uh, to keep women short, to keep women in a certain place, uh, in a private space, uh, and not take part of uh, in a public uh, space, where they can form also a threat to their own position. Um, you see the rise of those uh, ideologies, whether it's um, in, in certain parts of the Middle East, but also closer to home here in the Netherlands, where traditional norms, uh, certain norms that need to be emphasized and need to be restored. Um, but I think a deeper uh, discussion needs to be, uh, is, is behind that, and that is who, who actually wants to stay in power and what are the means these typically more or less men are using to stay in power. Do one use this religious text to remain his, his position in society, in households? And I think that you shouldn't step away from those kind of difficult discussions, but also use the, the actors also within those societies that actually want to have a different interpretation of religious text. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. I think it is something that many of us work on, the social norms underlying everything that keeps things in place that particularly feminist foreign policy wants to address. And it very much should be part of the conversation can, can, can moving forward. Yeah. Please go I, ahead. I just wanted, uh, based on my 20 years in the region, to say this is an extraordinarily difficult discussion. Make no mistake about that, extraordinarily difficult. I'm not a theologist, but I went to, well, the, the, the Shiite leaders in Najaf and Karbala and in Iran, I saw them all. And it is extremely difficult because it is very, very difficult to enter the door of their argumentation. Uh, it is almost impossible. You can do that from a very, very high meta, you know, citing the Bible, and then you are somewhere in the 55th floor, far away from the reality of the ground. But for the rest, uh, my experience, I'm very blunt on that, is that the discussion that you there and the discussion here are just completely apart. And a diplomacy like mine, that the German diplomacy is a diplomacy which since years tries to, we have these forums, we have these invitations, we have, and um, by the way, it is not really difficult also, uh, not, not very different also with, um, with uh, ultra-Orthodox Jews, it's exactly the same. Yeah. So it's a pattern of religion, probably with, with Catholics would not be diff different either. I just wanted to say to, to enter uh, a, a discussion which has a sociological impact on these representatives and on the many, many, many people who follow them blindly is difficult. Back to my, to my Egyptian president, he tries that. But he tries that with, 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 with a lot of cautious because he knows that that can swim, that, that can sh shift him away. And in the, in the, in the intellectual fight with the Al-Azhar, he is mostly the loser mm -hmm. because the public opinion as organized it is, I don't judge it, just uh, tends to follow them the uh, established religion. So extremely difficult. And I presume the next uh, generation of yours, you will be very busy with that if you're interested. Uh, and when we speak about feminist foreign policy, according to what I saw, you always have to factor that in. That is why my, my point of entry is always look at the concrete door where you can, because there, yeah. there you enter, even these people, there yeah. you enter into their, 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 their sense of reality. Thank you. I have two more questions from people in the audience, and then I will invite you to join us for drinks. I have Mia McKenzie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I represent the International Organization for Migration, and I have a question for Pascala, but perhaps all speakers wish to uh, contribute. Um, curious to know if and how you engage with diaspora representatives yeah. here in the Netherlands for more robust foreign pol policy abroad. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, it's actually not that easy um, to engage with the diaspora. We have with certain countries we have a good relationship and my colleagues at the Africa department have a few um, uh, groups actually they work with and they regularly meet. 
but we we were many of you i think were at the partos meeting yesterday as well and partos is the like the umbrella of all the dutch um uh, development organization and in the netherlands it's 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 complicated to involve the diaspora in foreign policy and development policy and that's one of the topics that we're actually looking into and how, how we can do that better and, and um, use that knowledge and improve our policies. So if you have any concrete suggestions, I would love to hear it because it's, it's not easy. No, no, actually we're, we're looking into that, why it's not easy, because it looks so uh, logical um, and it's not. So it's, it's actually, we're looking into that and it's not, it's not my department looking into that, but it's also mm. within the Partos, uh, people are looking into that who are much more knowledgeable about it. Um, but on a country level, it is sometimes possible, but on a foreign policy or international development policy mm. or development cooperation policy, it's much harder. So I don't know what the answer is, but I, I would love to find out. We have members yeah. that are the diaspora organization we can yeah. put in contact with. Uh, yeah. Yeah. with Great, you. thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then I have uh, Roman Badenburg. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm afraid I have a bit of an elephant in the room question. Um, <laughs> and the Canadian representative uh, ambassador has touched upon it a little bit uh, by saying that um, governments face a trade off. And um, my question is perhaps to also to the French ambassador, how would a European member state government reconcile the self-interest that is inherently part of our foreign policy with a more human rights driven feminist foreign policy. And I ask that because, for instance, when you look at the outcome document of the EU African summit, which was held at the beginning of this year, um, the, the, the stress is, is, is ultimately on issues like migration, um, security, mm -hmm. energy, and much less on human-centered uh, themes like um, uh, youth employment or uh, participation of, of girls. So I would like to see a bit of a, a trade-off that is shifting towards the other end. And ultimately, how do you deal with this inherent tension? Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I could I could start um, uh, f first I think that there is really no contradiction between promotion of uh, feminist diplomacy and uh, and uh, national interest because uh, we really are convinced that our interest is to promote uh, this diplomacy and I must say that my, my minister, for instance, Catherine Colonna, is extremely convinced of that because it's, it's part of our natural uh, position in the world to uh, defend human rights. And France has been active in this field for uh, many years. Of course, a state has positions on human rights, but the state has also economic interest, has security interest, and you, you, you can ask the question, are there contradictions? Are there, and, and of course, when you are dealing, and it has been addressed by, by my colleagues, when you are dealing with uh, uh, foreign states, they, they can, of course, uh, resent position you, positions you take on, on human rights in general, and in particular regarding feminist uh, diplomacy. And sometimes it creates difficulties in our relationships. And sometimes, for instance, France has some difficulties with some uh, African states, for instance. Yeah. Uh, we also uh, 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 pursue sometimes security actions related to human rights. For instance, uh, uh, what we did in Mali to counter the uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, enterprise, which was to create a new uh, uh, Islamic uh, state compared to, to uh, what was in Iraq, or mm -hmm. it was really designed to prevent some abuses. And uh, obviously, in, it may end up with situations where you have difficulties with local authorities. 
But regarding uh, African countries, we have also a lot of development activities which are very important and in which we, as I mentioned, uh, introduce this priority as something uh, which is now systematic. And it has a relationship also with finance in a way, because if you introduce this priority as a global and general priority in, for instance, a development policy, it means that you cannot uh, um, uh, pursue this diplomacy without taking this and you mobilize credits, you mobilize resources, which, which is related to this, uh, to this priority. So this is a way I, I would spontaneously react to yeah. this question, yeah. <laughs> which is not an easy question, I, I understand. It is not. And maybe it also, um, coming to the conclusion of everything that we listened to today and everything we discussed, it is your point is also about on all those trade-offs on a short term, probably, and we, we see that, that we go for interests that are maybe not in the interest of what would be a feminist foreign policy. I think it's also a matter, and you mentioned it in the beginning, it is about, it's a different way of looking at global development and it's encompassing and it's longer term. And in that sense, I now have to think also that this is the last day of the COP today, yeah. where the same thing goes on. We all know what is best for us in the long run and we let short term interests prevail. And I think your examples of, of the people in the panel at least have given me some hope that if you work on, on the very concrete and you really continue to apply this in everything that you do at all levels and in all sectors, we will, we will get there. We will change. It's systems change, really. Yeah. And I think we should be very happy that our ministry is embracing this initiative and inviting all of us to continue to work with them. So we will. Good. Thank you very Thank much you. to all Thank of you, you here Thank on the you. couch. Thank you.